morning on such a chilly day, and we want to welcome everyone watching at home, online. We are happy to have you with us. Um, we're a little shorthanded this morning, so I am hoping you all will be our rhythm section while you sing today, clapping. If anybody wants to play a tambourine or drums, jump in. <laughs> but we are happy to be here in the house of the Lord this morning, so let's lift him up. everybody. <laughs>
to join us and lift up your name and we just thank you just for voices to be able to lift you up this morning we ask you God just to touch those who are sick and unable to be here and their families Lord just to comfort them and let them know that you are in the midst of everything they're going through God we love you and we give you all the glory and it's in your holy name we pray amen
all may be seated this morning. Now it's our privilege to go to that great God in prayer. Um, we don't go to one who just, you know, will listen to us. We can't do anything about it. We go to one who is all-powerful, who's all-knowing, it's all-wise. And so uh, let's avail ourselves of that opportunity today. Let's not miss it. So uh, would you bow your heads in prayer with me? And if you'd like to join us here at the altar in, in prayer this morning, you're certainly welcome to come. Our Father, we praise you this morning that you really are the great God, that you are the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. We praise you that you are the one who has always been God and always will be God and is God at this very moment. We praise you that you are all sovereign, that you're all powerful that you're all knowing, that you're all wise. We praise you that you are holy. We praise you that you are a God of indescribable, inexplicable, incomprehensible love. We praise you that you love us w with a, a love that just never quits. We praise you that you love us with a a love that's infinite, that never runs out. We praise you that you love us with an unconditional love. Even though you know us inside and out. Oh, Father, thank you that in your love, you always welcome us into your presence. We praise you that in your love, you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to us. We praise you that you didn't turn your back on us, but sent the one most precious to you. We praise you that he came, that he walked these streets, that uh, he understands what it is the human experience is about. But more than that, we praise you that he suffered and died in our place for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be in right relationship with you, and so that someday we could share all of eternity with you. We praise you that in your love, when Jesus returned to you, you did not abandon us as orphans, knowing we wouldn't make it for a moment on our own, but that you gave us your spirit to be with us and in us. We praise you that you gave him to us to be your guaranteeing deposit of all of eternity. Father, we come to you this morning confessing our absolute dependence on you, confessing our need of you. Um, we need your grace. We need your mercy. We need your encouragement. We need your counsel. Oh, Lord, we need you. We have specific needs today, and we lift them to you. Thank you that... Uh, Nothing is too big or too small to bring to you. Father, you know about our personal needs today. You know those who uh, have illness. We pray that you bring healing. You know those who have uh, conflicting relationships. And we pray that you would bring healing to those. You know all the, the breadth of our need today. Father, you know about our needs as a congregation. We pray that, that you would supply those and that you would continue to work through us. We pray specifically that uh, in your time and in your way, you would provide the shepherd that this congregation needs. Father, we pray for our world today. It has needs. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would supply those needs. We pray that you would provide food for those who are hungry and even starving. We pray that you would provide uh, 
liberation for those who need freedom. We pray that you would provide peace for those who have war all around them. Thank you that you understand. Father, we give this service to you. It's yours. We ask that you would use it for your glory. We ask that you would speak through it to us and that we would have ears to hear. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad you uh, decided to come and join us this morning, and some of you probably drove through some snowy roads on the way and maybe some icy spots, um, but we're glad that you um, have chosen to come and join us this morning. Um, we do have communion um, this morning, so if you have not gotten your communion elements, there are baskets at the back of the um, worship center, so you can get up at this moment and you can go grab those communion elements if you have not already um, gotten yours. Also, just a reminder, our church offering can be given online um, or through the church app, or you can give in the boxes that are located in the back of the um, ministry center as well. Sunday school class, um, we have those at 11 o'clock today. Um, we have children meeting downstairs, and then we also have two adult classes, and then our teens are also meeting in the teen room. And our Wednesday night, family night, we didn't have this past week because we had uh, no school for Washington County Public Schools. So um, we will resume getting those Wednesday night um, classes and um, fun family night uh, back in order this week as long as we don't have any inclement weather. And just as a reminder, the inclement weather policy is on the back of our sheet here. If Washington County Public Schools is closed, then we do not have our Wednesday night programming. So just as a reminder. Um, and then our game night, which was supposed to be held this past Friday night, is going to be this coming Friday night. So January 26th at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. And be sure to bring your favorite game. I know our family got lots of cool games for Christmas. And so um, I'm going to be bringing some of my favorite games. Um, bring your own beverage and a snack to share as well. Coffee and water will be available. Also, if you are interested in helping to clean up the parsonage, it does say attention, ladies, but I know um, last Sunday um, we talked about how men can help too. Um, so please let Mindy Lewis know if you are one of those people that would love to um, uh, clean some windows and tubs and floors and sinks and so forth. Um, also, the giving statements are out on the Welcome Center area. Um, please stop by and make sure you pick up your giving statement. Um, also, suitcases are still needed for the Honduras trip, and we also want to be in prayer for our Honduras trip, our group that's going. Um, they leave on February 1st and will return on the 10th, so we'll want to pray for their time um, as they go and serve. Also, um, on the back side of our sheet, the coldest night of the year is coming up for REACH. Um, I did just talk to Carol this morning, and there is a flyer out in the foyer um, on the flyer, there is a QR code, and if you just scan the QR code, it will take you to the place that you need to go to find our church and be able to sign up and register for um, being a walker in the coldest night of the year. And I understand there's a really cool um, hat that you get if you sign up, so you might not want to miss out on that hat and sign up. Um, let's see. Then the next thing that I want to bring your attention to, and this is for all of our ladies, um, we are headed to the E-Women's Conference at the Giant Center in Hershey in September. Um, the registration has to be completed if you want the early bird um, registration um, by Friday, March the 29th. And we do have many ladies who have already signed up. Super excited about that. Um, Tim Tebow is going to be there, Angie Smith, um, Margaret Feinberg, and Julie Clinton at this point. And I know there's others that are going to be added to the list. Um, we are super excited about that. So the directions of how to get um, registered are there. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me. Um, I did have a couple ladies ask about um, hotel accommodations and how is that going to work. Um, we will take care of the ho hotel accommodations once we know who's going to be registered. So as soon as we get to that March 29th date, then we'll con I will connect with ladies about um, locating hotel accommodations and so forth. If you have any questions, please let me know. 
And then I think that's about it for that. Um, I also want to remind you, um, as a church board, we um, continue to pray and are in prayer for our pastoral transition. But I wanted to bring your attention back to our December 10th um, letter from Dr. Bowser. Um, The church board does have a meeting this Thursday night. um, And as a part of his letter, he did share that at our next meeting, we would be um, reviewing additional resumes. So we will be reviewing those additional resumes this coming Thursday night. And um, just please be in prayer for what the resumes look like and um, how the Lord is going to lead us. Um, And we don't know. The right pastor might not be in that list of resumes. So we'll just take it one step at a time, but just continue to pray for um, us as a board and um, pray for our church as a whole. And I think that's it. So now I'm going to dismiss the children. And we now have a responsive reading. So if you would stand with me as we read our responsive reading. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. And God saw that it was good. God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that it was good. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered in one place and let dry ground appear. And God saw that it was good. God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth. Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. God said, let us make man in our own image, in our, in our likeness. And God saw that it was good. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Well, let's, let's, let's do a little housekeeping here for a second. Uh, only not looking forward, but more looking in the rearview mirror, okay? Uh, two, two Sundays ago, what did we do? Yeah, we canceled service. Um, there was, there was a, a, a very tiny group that was empowered to make that decision, and on Saturday night, it, it didn't look good at all. And so we did the prudent thing. Yes, I was a part of that. And uh, we canceled service. And we all know we could have had service, couldn't we? So forgive us. You know, we apologize. Then last Sunday, you had Pastor Liz Powers with you. Isn't she delightful? Um, Incredible uh, young communicator. But uh, here was the story. 
I, I knew Pastor Liz would be sympathetic to needing to drop everything and run for childbirth. Uh, she's been through it four times. She has four daughters, five and under. Can you imagine? But anyways, uh, she was lined up because Ruth and I were committed to taking care of granddaughter number one when granddaughter number two arrived. Well, you know, kids are kids, and she came two weeks early, and everybody's fine, but now I've, I've already lined up past Pastor Liz, so she preached last Sunday. Uh, she was going to cover either last Sunday or this Sunday, and uh, do it on a moment's notice. So that, that's what happened there. As far as we can tell, uh, we're going to miss one more Sunday before Easter, so we, we've got a kind of a straight shot in here, so. Okay, let's, let's talk about ownership a bit. Have you ever been involved in an ownership dispute? So, oh, no, not me. I've, I've never been involved with something like that. Uh, I beg to differ. At least if you had siblings. Uh-huh. And I, you, you remember, you both had yo-yos, right? And... And his was red, and yours was blue, or was yours red and his blue? Wh whatever. One day, you caught him playing with your blue yo-yo. You screamed and tried to take it away from him, and he hit you, and you cried crocodile tears, and about then, mom appeared in the doorway and demanded to know what in the world was going on. Now, personally, I think it's rather obvious, don't you? It's, it's an ownership dispute. Now, now, some of you have been involved in ownership disputes concerning matters far more serious than toys. Uh, you and your favorite neighbor may have disagreed over the location of the property line for years until you finally had to take expensive legal steps to get it settled uh, in divorce proceedings you and your former spouse may have hotly contested who was best suited to retain ownership of the family dog or something far more serious than that Ownership disputes can even be historic. Did you know that? Um, one of the major issues in colonial Maryland, you know, where, where, where we live, was our boundary controversies with our neighbors. I mean, we didn't get along with our neighbors well at all. Uh, we squabbled with Delaware for years over a few square miles on the eastern shore and it wasn't even beachfront property. We, we won our quarrel with Virginia, and we retained ownership of the entire Potomac River. Remember, Virginia doesn't begin to this day until the waters of the Potomac uh, cease. Uh, our dispute with Pennsylvania finally resulted in that famous surveyed border called the what? The Mason-Dixon line. I'll never forget a funeral that I conducted. This is when I was very early here. I conducted one Sunday afternoon in Hancock, Maryland. Now, the burial of the remains of this deceased elderly lady who happened to be a charter member of our church was in a private family cemetery up on one of the ridges outside of town. Well, after the committal service, you know, the, the graveside service, the family just kind of lingered. It was a beautiful day. And, and they started tracing their family tree from tombstone to tombstone. I mean, it, it was fascinating to watch. Well, while I was on the side waiting, an older gentleman came up beside me, kind of shoulder to shoulder, and started telling me about how this cemetery had been in their family since before the Revolutionary War. So sometime before 1776. 
But then he made a statement that kind of startled me. He said, this cemetery used to be in Pennsylvania until them English fellers, Mason and Dixon, came through here. Over 200 years had passed, and still the ownership dispute lingered on, at least in this gentleman's mind. Now, this is all very illustrative of the fact that we consider ownership and property titles to be pretty doggone important. In fact, it, it seems to be a fairly commonly held human value. Ownerships, ownership disputes are at the heart uh, of many of our conflicts and much of our litigation. So having said all of that, I wonder how God feels about ownership. You know, just a, a couple of minutes ago, we read the biblical account of creation. It, it, it is such a beautiful story. In fact, it's a hymn that exalts God as the creator of heaven and earth. Now, think about the sequence of events again. The hymn declares how God started with absolutely nothing. No raw material. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness pervaded all. Then the scriptures describe how on the first day of creation, God created light. How he then separated day from night. Then he stood back and said, hmm, that's good. Uh, then on day two, we're told how God separated the water from the sky Oh, day three was a busy day. God separated the earth from the water and formed dry ground, creating land and seas. Then on that dry ground, he planted vegetation, plants and trees, you know, apples and peaches and pears and tomatoes and potatoes and carrots and probably a few green beans in there. And at the end of the day, God stepped back surveyed his, uh, his, his, his work and declared, that's good. On the fourth day, God hung the sun and the moon and the stars, placing them there to separate day from night. And at the end of that day, we overhear God exclaiming, that's good. Now, on day five, God created fish and birds. You know, blue jays, cardinals, orioles. You see, God really is a baseball fan. And spring training is just a, just a couple of weeks away, a few weeks away. He, he created trout and swordfish and flounder. He instructed them to be fruitful and increase. And at the end of the day, we hear God express with great satisfaction, that's good. The sixth day, however, was God's most stupendous. It begins with him creating livestock and wild animals, you know, pigs, sheep, goats, and cows, and bears, and rabbits, and deer. And once again, we hear God affirming, that's good. But he saved his highest creation until last, humankind. He created human beings in his very own image, male and female. Then with an irrepressible smile, God stepped back and exclaimed, that's good. That's very, very good. Now creation was complete, so on the seventh day, God rested. Now, while God is resting, stop here for a moment and ask yourself this question. Who owns all of this? You know, the, the heavens, the seas, the lands, the plants, the trees, the birds, the fish, the animals, and the human beings. Whose name is on the title of all this stuff? 
Now, God was very, very fond of the man that he had created on day six. He had tenderly formed this man out of the dust of the dry ground, and then he had breathed his own life into him. To this man, God gave the name Adam. Well, after a while, God noticed that Adam seemed to be lonely. And God said to himself, it is not good for man to be alone. So after inducing a deep sleep, God removed one of Adam's ribs and from it created a woman to be Adam's life companion. To this very real first lady, Adam gave the name Eve. Now, God placed Adam and Eve in a perfect environment, a, a beautiful garden that God himself had planted. Uh, it had all kinds of gorgeous trees that produced lush, sweet fruit. The garden was watered by a river that ran right through it. Now, God did not place this couple in the garden to sit around idly every day. They were to work it and, and, and cultivate it, take care of it. Adam, among other duties, was assigned the responsibility of naming all the creatures that lived in the garden. You see, God made them stewards of the garden. Now, you know what a steward is, right? It's, it's kind of like a, an estate manager. Uh, the property does not belong to him, but he is to supervise and care for it according to the owner's expressed wishes. This is why God had placed Adam and Eve in the garden, to be his stewards. Now, now freeze frame this picture in your mind for a moment, and let me ask you this question. What gave God the right to appoint Adam and Eve as stewards over this garden? Now, when God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, he informed them of his garden rules. Looking around, God announced, you may eat of any tree in the garden. But then pointing to one particular tree in the middle, he declared, but under no circumstances are you ever to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This was his first rule, and it came with a warning. God said, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Well, sometime later on a bright spring morning, Eve is casually walking about the garden, enjoying all of its magnificent beauty. While she is still out on her stroll, Satan comes along in the form of a serpent and slyly asks, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Oh, Eve quickly corrects Satan, telling him they may eat of any tree. Oh, except that one in the middle. Then Satan suggests, Eve, honey, don't be so naive and believe everything you hear. You're not going to die. God just knows that if you eat the fruit of that tree, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be as smart as he is. Ah, go ahead, eat the fruit. Eve walks over to the tree that's just a few feet away. The fruit looks so good, and oh, how she'd like to gain knowledge and wisdom. And then we watch in utter disbelief. As Eve reaches out, picks a piece of ripe fruit, and then eats it. She doesn't stop at that, though. She picks another piece of fruit, takes it to Adam, and he too eats it. Both Adam and Eve have disobeyed God and broken his garden rule. Later on that evening, God comes to the garden for a visit. He often does this in the cool of the day. This time, however, Adam and Eve are nowhere to be found. So God calls out, where are you? After a bit, 
Adam and Eve reluctantly emerged from their hiding place, mumbling something about being afraid because they're naked. At that, God looks them straight in the eye and asks, Who told you that? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to ever eat from? Well, Adam, being male, blames his wife. And Eve tries to pin it all on the serpent. You know, the devil made me do it. God, however, will not buy any of these excuses any more than he'll buy our excuses. Instead, he begins to pronounce judgment. Eve will now experience pain, severe pain in childbirth. Adam will now have to work long, painful hours to till the soil and battle the thorns and the thistles in order to grow food. Then, God ushers them out of the garden, tells them not to come back, and places an angelic guard at the entrance to ensure they do not. He said, now, wait a minute. Let me ask you another question. What gave God the right to evict Adam and Eve from their garden home? Now, there's another story from the book of Genesis that I, that I want us to consider. It occurs hundreds, if not thousands of years later. However, it's only about six or seven pages over from Adam and Eve. It's the story of the patriarch Abraham. While living in Haran, Abraham, in spite of his pagan background, hears the voice of the Lord beckoning. Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Amazingly, Abraham obeys. He, his wife Sarah, and his nephew Lot, along with their entire household and all their possessions, follow the leading of God to Canaan. Well, there in Canaan, God abundantly blesses these semi-nomadic sheep ranchers. In fact, it gets to the point where Abraham's herds and Lot's herds are just too big to graze in the same area together. The land just can't support all of them. So, in fact, it's getting so bad that Abraham's herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen are, are bitterly quarreling and about to come to blows. So Abraham calls Lot to the top of a high hill one day for a summit meeting. He looks his beloved nephew in the eye. Now, this is the nephew he has raised like a son. He looks him in the eye and tenderly says to them, Lot, we, we, we can't go on like this. Come on, we're, we're family. Then Abraham makes this suggestion. We, we, we've just got to part company. Look, the, the whole land is before you. You take first choice. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot stands there and gazes in all directions for the longest time. He slowly weighs his decision. It's serious. Finally, his eyes keep fastening on the well-watered, fertile, green plains down there by the Jordan River. He points to it and announces, I'll go there. He chooses the very, very best land for himself. Well, after Lot leaves and Abraham is still contemplating what he should do, the Lord comes to him. The Lord quietly, calmly utters this assurance. Abraham, look in every direction. Look north. Look south, look east, look west. I'm going to give it all to you and your descendants. Now, now remember, this land is not vacant. It is inhabited by thousands and thousands of Canaanites and Perizzites who have lived here for generations. 
So, so let me ask you yet another question. What gives God the right to give Abraham this land when it is already inhabited by others who have title to it? You say, Pastor Dick, can, can you stop there? Um, I'm, th these are all really neat stories and all, but is this going anywhere? What are you getting at? Simply this, the first principle of stewardship. You see, you can't begin to understand stewardship without comprehending this principle. You'll, you'll always be doomed to picky questions, legalistic formulas, and the rationalistic search for loopholes until you come to grips with this incredible truth. Now, while it only contains three small words, it's profound. So, are you, are you ready for the first principle of stewardship? You see, this is what I've been getting at and talking about for over 20 minutes now. So here it is. It's all God's. That's it. Why don't you say it with me? It's all God's. Now, now let's walk back through these biblical stories for a moment. God created the heavens and the earth, the land and the seas, and, and all that is in them. So whose stuff is all of this? It's all God's. He created it, so obviously he owns it. God created Adam and Eve, the very first man and woman, and places them in a garden to take care of it. So... What gives him the right to appoint them as stewards? It's all God's. He can entrust it to whomever he wishes. Well, then Adam and Eve sin, and God evicts them from the garden. What gives him the right to throw them out of their home? It's all God's. Not only can he give whatever to whomever he likes, he can also take it away. Then on top of that hill, God gives the entire land of Canaan to Abraham and, and to his succeeding generations. So what gives him the right to give Abraham this land that is already inhabited by others? It's all God's. He can give it to whomever he chooses. The first principle of stewardship is simply, profoundly this. It's all God's. Now, the, the implications of this principle are just absolutely enormous. For instance, it has global implications. I mean, why should we care about polluting the air that we and others breathe, or polluting the water that we and others drink? Or why should we be concerned about hurricane victims in the Philippines or Central America who will not recover for, for decades? Why? Because it's all God's. Uh, this principle has church implications. Have you ever noticed how sometimes people get rather possessive of their churches? I mean, they determine in their minds that things have to be a certain way, no matter what. That's a dangerous attitude. And you know why? Because it's all God. This principle has tremendous personal implications for each and every one of us. We, we get rather enamored with that pronoun, my, you know, M-Y. We talk about my house, 
my car, my career, my rights, my family, my money, my, 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 my. Folks, I got news for you. It's not yours. None of it. It's all God's. All of it. He's just allowing you to be stewards of it at the moment. The call to follow Christ and to live the Christian life is the call to openly acknowledge it's all God's. Now, can I, can I tell you one more Bible story? It's hundreds of years later, and Abraham's descendants, the Israelites, are now marching into Canaan, the promised land, the, the land God promised to Abraham on top of that hill. They're marching in to take possession of it. Well, they experience a great victory over the major city of Jericho when God just brings down the city walls. Now, when they, are, when they raid Jericho, God has already given them some special rules for this battle. They are to keep nothing for themselves personally. All the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron is to be deposited in the Lord's treasury. Well, there's an Israelite named Achan who disobeys by keeping a few things for himself which he buries beneath his tent. A short time later, a small Israeli force is sent up to the tiny town of Ai to conquer it. But this time, just the opposite happens. The Israelite soldiers are thoroughly routed and defeated. The Lord reveals to Joshua, Israel's leader, that it's because there has been disobedience. Well, eventually, Achan's sin is discovered. He is swiftly brought to judgment and executed. Understand, at the heart of Achan's sin was his violation of the first principle of stewardship. It's all God's, and therefore must be used at his direction. Now, let me just, let me be confessional for a moment. I, on my journey in life and ministry, I've had to come to grips with this principle on, on several occasions. Uh, there, there, there was one time when there, there were some areas of ministry that had come to me that I just thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed. It, you know, it was kind of the time when you just go, That's, this is what God's wired me to do. And, and I enjoyed them for, for several years. Uh, they were great sources of meaning and fulfillment for me. But then through circumstances that that I didn't fully understand, don't to this day, they were disappearing. I, I confess to you, I struggled. It hurt deeply. But I had to reaffirm, it's all God's. It's his to give. It's his to withdraw. So let me ask you, what is it you have that you're trying to keep for yourself? What is it that you are attempting to bury beneath your tent to keep from God? Let me remind you that the Christian life is to be one of full, complete, total surrender to God. It is one that openly declares in both word and action it's all God's. John Wesley speaks eloquently of this principle in what has come to be called his covenant prayer. I, I want us to read it together this morning. And it's going to be on, on the screen. Uh, I want us to do it deliberately. 
so that it soaks in and, and we comprehend what it is we're praying. Uh, Adam, can you put that up there for us? Ah, there it is. Read this with me, will you? I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with who you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by you or laid aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low by you. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. So what does this have to do with the sacrament of the Lord's Supper? Well, actually, a lot. Think about the, the, the elements and their symbolism of commun in communion. The bread, Christ's broken body. The cup, Christ's shed blood. It all speaks so vividly of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf, of him taking our place, of Jesus suffering and dying for our sins, all so that we could be forgiven, come into right relationship with God, and someday share eternity with him. You see, this sacrament speaks loudly and clearly of the fact that God has given his all for us. So how are we to respond to his action on our behalf? Folks, there's, there's only one appropriate way. By openly declaring over everything in our lives, it's all God's. So let me ask it again. What is it you're trying to keep from God? And isn't it time you declared it's all God's. I want you to hold those elements. Hold that cup. Look at it. Think about what that symbolizes. The fact that God is, is all in for us. And then let the Holy Spirit examine your heart about your commitment and are you saying it's all God's let's pray our father we are grateful that you held back absolutely nothing when it came to us in our salvation. Thank you that you committed your all. Father, would you, through your spirit, examine our hearts? Have we said it's all yours? Or is there something that we are clinging to and trying to keep clinging to. Father, let this, please, let this be the, the morning, the moment when, when someone says, Father, it, it, it's all yours now. I take my hands off. Jesus took the bread, broke it, gave it to them and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
and shall we do the same? he also took the cup blessed it and gave it to them and said take drink all of you for this is my blood which is shed for the forgiveness of sins do this in remembrance of me and shall we do the same and father we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And this morning, and we'll close in a hymn. I know you know this one. Lord bless you as you go from here saying over everything in your life it's all God's God bless you